Tonight is a night for wishing. If you could have one wish, what would it be? This is my wish for you. Much more than this, I wish you love. And in July, a lemonade to cool you in some beefy glade. I wish you health, much more than wealth. I wish you My breaking heart and I agree that you and I could never be. And so with my best, my very best, I set you free. I wish you shelter from the storm. One cozy fire to keep you warm, but most of all, when snowflakes fall, I wish you love. My breaking heart and I agree that you and I. So with my best, my very best, I set you free. I wish you shelter from the storm, one cozy fire to keep you warm. Most of all, when snowflakes fall, I wish you love. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Harry Reasoner. I'm Ed Bradley. Those stories and more tonight on 60 Minutes. Unlike Christmas or the 4th of July, which come at the same time every year, it's hard to know exactly when premiere week on television is going to come. One thing, however, is certain. It always comes just before the World Series, which almost didn't come at all this year, and the Miss America contest, which always comes no matter what. It'll be a long time before the Miss America pageant comes around again, and I thought this might be a good time to review the whole Miss America mess. We got hold of pictures of every one of the Miss Americas since 1921, 54 of them. There were all kinds. To be honest with you, I'm not always satisfied with who wins. As a matter of fact, I don't want to make any of the girls cry again, but I'm always surprised at how many homely girls there are in the pageant. I have a feeling the best looking women don't enter contests. You can't always tell from a picture, we all know that. Look at these winners. Marilyn Buford, 1946. 1980 winner, Cheryl Pruitt. Some of these girls were probably real beauties, but they just didn't photograph well. The queen of femininity. You know how that is. I'm actually a lot better looking than I look myself. I only remember about five names from this whole group. Phyllis George was Miss America in 1971. I remember her. She's even better looking now although she doesn't know any more about football. Joe Carroll Dennison, I don't remember. She was Miss America in 1942. She must have been worried about the war. Bess Meyerson, of course, she was Miss America 36 years ago, and she's still an exceptionally good-looking woman. Hairdressers have always had a time with Miss Americas, although in most cases the girl's hair 
would have looked better undressed. They didn't do some of these girls much good with makeup. Venus Raimi, 1944. Venus was all lipstick here. In 1952, Colin K. Hutchins was a naturally beautiful woman. And look what someone did to her. I've picked my own five finalists for the title of all-time Miss America. And here they are. Shirley Cothran, 1975. Betty Cooper, 1937, a sort of all-American Miss America. Mary Campbell won twice in 1922 and 1923. Cam Eldred, 1970, interesting-looking beauty. And the winner, runner-up to nobody, the 1958 Miss America, Marilyn Van Derber. Miss America. Well, there can only be one winner, of course, and it does seem too bad. Some of those losers seem too good to throw away. Hello. You know, the kitchen is a wonderful room. It's a place where spicy aromas and good food abound, where a neighbor can drop in from next door, where the family often loves to gather. In many ways, the kitchen is the friendliest room in your home. It's no wonder, then, that so many people think of the kitchen as an ideal place for a colorful extension telephone. For in addition to being a convenience day in and day out, a phone in your kitchen just naturally makes it an even friendlier place for a relaxing chat anytime. For the after-school set, hungry as usual and bubbling over with news. And for neighborly visits most anytime. A good friend, the kitchen phone. It helps make your kitchen an even more pleasant place to be. And of course, it's a great time and step saver for the whole family. Order your kitchen phone by simply calling your Bell Telephone business office. Hello, I'm Marilyn Vanderber. How about playing a new game with me? It's called In or Out, and it goes like this. Sports cars? Naturally, they're in. That's right, the kooky look is out. Natural look, in. Sunglasses are in, too. How are you doing at the game? Fun, isn't it? Here's some more. Straight hair is in. Even freckles. And you know, old-fashioned, expensive watches are out. Today, Timex is in. Look at my Timex. Only $15. And it's chic as can be. See, it's like a bracelet and even has a guard chain. And of course, waterproof watches are in. Who doesn't need one? This Timex waterproof watch costs only $11.95. It's dustproof and shock resistant, too. There's a beautiful collection of Timex watches, from sportive to diamonds. No wonder more and more smart women wear Timex. It's the in thing to do. And speaking for the telephone hour, here is Marilyn Vandeberg. Good evening. Do you hear the bells? They ring in hope of a bright new year. And they ring in celebration. Tonight, we celebrate 21 years of the telephone hour at the beginning on radio and now on television. There have been 21 years of music in these halls and hundreds of artists. Grace Moore sang for us and Mary Martha, Ezio Pinza, Bing Crosby. We heard Rubenstein, Hoffman, and Van Cuyver. Fritz Chrysler played humorous. Benny Goodman played jazz. Marian Anderson was here, and she sang Ave Maria. Groucho Marx enacted Coco in the Mikado. Carl Sandberg recited a Lincoln portrait. It was just two years ago that the telephone hour made its television debut. On that program, 
Renata Tibaldi sang Madame Butterfly. Tonight, she is with us again to recreate that performance. <laughs> artists have come from the world over to be with us. Among others, Joshua Heifetz, Gregor Piatagorsky, Andrei Segovia. And through the years, these concert artists have performed with our symphony orchestra under the baton of Donald Voorhees. We've always saluted the musical theater, great ladies and gentlemen of Broadway. In the past year, such ladies as Ethel Merman, Nanette Fabre, such gentlemen as Alfred Drake, Robert Preston. This evening, we see the excitement of Broadway, the excitement of an opening night, as Shirley Jones and Keith Andes salute the musical of the current season. to Louisville. And to Churchill Downs, the setting of the great Kentucky Derby, America's most famous horse race. We're going to show you something of the great festival that surrounds the Kentucky Derby and, of course, the colorful festival parade. The Kentucky Derby lasts for 11 days and draws thousands of visitors to Louisville from all over the country. Hundreds of people start lining up outside Churchill Downs the day before the race. They actually sleep in line, don't they, Pat? And they get to the track at about 8.30 in the morning, and then they camp out for the day in the infield. And the point is that the early ones get the best positions to see the finish of the race. But you're in the best position to see the race, the parade, and the other events of Festival Week. So what say we begin with a look at the colorful setting of this famous event as seen through the eyes of our news film cameras last year. Now, here are your hostess and host for the 1968 Cotton Bowl Festival Parade, Marilyn Vanderbur and Jack Linkletter. Hi, y'all, and a very happy new year from Dallas, Texas. And welcome to the 11th annual edition of the famous Cotton Bowl Festival Parade. We're here at the biggest state fairgrounds in the country, the Texas State Fair Park, the home of the world-famous Cotton Bowl. CBS Television is starting the new year with a colorful and exciting series of events. In just a moment, Jack and I will be bringing you the famous Cotton Bowl Festival Parade. And then we're going to take you to Pasadena, California, for the oldest and largest of all New Year's Day parades, the beautiful Tournament of Roses. Brought to you by Bess Meyerson and Mike Douglas. And then back to Dallas, about 100 yards from where we're standing now, into the Cotton Bowl for the big game between Texas A&M and the University of Alabama. Now, the Cotton Bowl parade is just about ready to begin. It's a great one. It's especially colorful this year, all 20 floats. And also we have 22 prize-winning marching bands and some of the loveliest girls you've ever seen, including Miss Teenage America, the lovely model of the year, the 1968 Maid of Cotton, and dozens of university queens. I love it already. <laughs> the theme of this year's parade is a world of fantasy. And to see all this fantasy, the route of march is jammed with thousands. They range from babes in arms to traditional watchers of this great parade, and it'll be underway in just one minute. Live from downtown Dallas, Texas, the 1969 Cotton Bowl Festival Parade. Now, here are your hostess and host for the 1969 Cotton Bowl Festival Parade, lovely Marilyn Vanderbur and Jack Linkletter. Howdy, y'all, and a very happy new year from downtown Dallas, Texas. And welcome to the 12th annual Cotton Bowl Festival Parade. Marilyn and I are pleased to be back, bringing you a parade that's always beautiful and exciting. Once again, the Cotton Bowl Parade starts off Dallas's contribution to a really wonderful day here on CBS TV. Jack and I will be describing this thrilling parade for the next hour, and then you'll be going to Pasadena, California, for the Tournament of Roses Parade. Then back here to Dallas for that great big Cotton Bowl football game between Texas and Tennessee. 
With so many friends down here in Maryland, I don't see how we can bet for anybody but Texas. I agree, but I have a bet. I'll bet that this year's Cotton Bowl Parade is the best ever. No bet. It will be. I, we guarantee that. Next, we want to show you that this is really a fair for the whole family. The children have not been neglected. In fact, many exhibits are centered around the children. The fair opens at 9 o'clock in the morning, and the earlier you bring them, the less chance they'll be of having to wait to get into the things you want to see. Now let's take a look at some of the children's attractions. I'd say the children have been well provided for at the fair, wouldn't you, Derwin? <laughs> they certainly have, Marilyn. You know, the wonderful thing about a Great World's Fair is the incredible variety of the entire thing. Now, on these fairgrounds, you can eat African food. You can even order a suit of clothes from Hong Kong. <laughs> you can see a fabulous jeweled carpet from India. You can drive an antique car, listen to Irish poetry, test your driving skill. You can watch a demonstration of atomic fusion, and you can even take a nap at the sleep center. You know, one of the most wonderful exhibits at the fair this year is the beautiful tribute to Sir Winston Churchill. And Jack Linkletter is the lucky man who drew the assignment of showing you a little bit of that. Thank you, Jack. We've seen a number of new exhibits tonight, but the Churchill Pavilion alone is enough to prove that if you saw the fair of 1964, you haven't seen the fair of 65. The fair opens at 9 o'clock in the morning, and that's a good time to come because it isn't as crowded then. If you do come out and it's a bright day, it's a good idea to bring your sunglasses. And if it's cloudy, bring your raincoats. There are plenty of lockers to keep them in. Next, we'll be seeing the Belgian village. But first, a word from American Airlines. Well, that's just about it. A brief opening night look at the 1965 fair. And what an opening. It's beautiful and exciting. All 646 acres of it. I know you're cold. Are you tired of walking all those acres? Oh, say, I've just started. You just, and I know you yes, love sir. it. Yes, <laughs> sir. I do. Mm. I'm going to go back again and again and again. Well, I don't blame you at all. It's a very exciting opening and a fabulous fair. Derwin? Yeah, Jack, I guess that's about it. I'm about as warm as a bucket of ice cube, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things to see out here, so let's wrap it up now, huh? We'll look forward to seeing you all at the fair. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Let's go to the... What are you looking for, Leroy? Oh, I'm a gopher, Marilyn. I'm looking for the airplane that carries voices. Voices? Leroy heard me say that your friends at C&P now fly your voice over the mountains. And they do, but not in airplanes, certainly. Look over there, Leroy. See that big high tower? Well, lots of times when people call long distance, their voices are carried up to the top of a tower like this, then radioed over the mountains and picked up by a big receiver on another tower miles and miles away, then put on wires again and carried into the home of the party they're calling. How come they do that? It saves money, Leroy. Help C&P give West Virginians the best telephone service at the least cost. What are you looking for now, Leroy? Nothing. Just got a crick in my neck. Golly, I'm a goofer. Live from the Tarrant County Convention Center in Fort Worth, Texas, the final 90 minutes of the 1969 Miss Teenage America pageant. Ladies and gentlemen, your television hostess, Marilyn Vandiver. Each one of these candidates has been chosen as an outstanding teenager in her hometown or through the National Candidate at Large program. They've all come together this week in Fort Worth for the final week of judging for the title of Miss Teenage America. The selection of the eight semi-finalists is done on the basis of personal interviews for poison personality, talent competition, and scholastic tests. In just a moment, Dick Clark will announce the names of the semi-finalists, and those eight lovely and talented girls will continue the competition for Miss Teenage America 1970. Sarah, 
Stockwell from Colorado Springs, Colorado. I can't emphasize strongly enough what, well, as Dick Clark said, courage it takes to perform as these young girls did here tonight. Miss Teenage America, Melissa Babish can verify that. Melissa, how did you feel last year when you were backstage waiting to be called on to perform your talent? Oh, I was just scared to death, and I remember that I crossed my fingers. Well, let's take a look and see what happened after you heard your introduction and you uncrossed your fingers. Did you have any idea at this point that you might possibly win? Oh, I was having so much fun I couldn't even think of such a thing. <laughs> it's a darling number. Well, what do you think of your performance? Well, my mother made my costume, and as you, as you can see, it looked a little big. And I don't believe that I look so young. You've aged beautifully, Melissa. Let's both cross our fingers for the next three semi-finalists waiting backstage. Now, they have their fingers crossed, and we have our fingers crossed, and their families. Let's see, that's two, four, six. Well, anyway, it's a lot of crossed fingers. I find it here tonight. Because all of you have been working for one goal for weeks, maybe months. And perhaps one of you will be our next Miss America. It's always difficult to predict who will win. No two Miss Americas are ever alike. Perhaps one is more beautiful or one is more talented or perhaps she's just a little bit luckier. You know what competition goes into becoming a Miss America. Let me let you in on my little secret and tell you how I really won the title of Miss America for 1958, because it happened in a most unusual way. I had competed on Wednesday and Thursday nights in talent and in swimsuit, but I hadn't won any of the preliminary judgings. So I naturally thought that Friday night was my last chance to do a good job, and I was to be judged in formal evening gown. Well, I had been scrubbed from head to toe, Mother had pressed my formal at least five times, and I had on brand new long white kid gloves, the very first pair I had ever owned. And I was so proud and careful not to muss my beautiful gown in any way. While I was standing in front of the elevator getting ready to go downstairs, when a door opened across the hallway, and a little old lady walked out. She had beautiful white hair and a twinkle in her eye, and she said, Miss Colorado, I've been looking for you all week. I want you to meet Mr. John. And I said, well, I'd love to meet Mr. John. So she disappeared into her room, and in a minute she came back, and on a leash, she was leading the ugliest bulldog I ever saw in my entire life. He had a, a typical mashed-in face. I could tell from the way he walked, he'd had arthritis for several years. And with no disrespect to Mr. John, a little soap and water wouldn't have hurt him at all. Well, this sweet little lady looked up at me, and she said, Miss Colorado, I want you to pet Mr. John. Well, I looked at Mr. John, and I looked at my pretty white gloves, and I really wasn't sure exactly what to say until she said, you know, the last two girls who have petted Mr. John have won the title of Miss America, and before she had even completed the sentence, I was on my hands and knees petting Mr. John. <laughs> so I feel that it's, I'll never forget when I went down to North Carolina. I was emceeing the Miss North Carolina state pageants. There were 80 girls in the state pageant. Four different nights, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the finals on Saturday night. It was such an elegant pageant. Well, just before the curtain went up on Saturday night, I went over to one of the contestants and I said, you're not nervous, are you? And she said, well, I'm not nervous, but we live 70 miles from here. And my father was so nervous that he forgot his shoes and he's sitting out there in the audience tonight in his best suit and his bedroom slippers. <laughs> Bill, how many times in your life have you challenged yourself? How many times have you really...